everybody in the world, we all have everything that we need right now to be and become. Like you have everything right now to be and become. Think about that. I'm going to say it one more time. You have everything right now to be and become whatever it is that you want to be. So there's going to be things in life that happen that you don't have any control over. This is The Fighting Entrepreneur, the podcast dedicated to entrepreneurs looking to change the world. Learn how to start, build, and scale a business in today's highly competitive business environment. Here's your host, The Fighting Entrepreneur, Anik Singhal. What's going on, you crazy fighting entrepreneurs? Guess who it is? Your favorite person in the whole wide world, it's Anik Singhal, back with another episode of The Fighting Entrepreneur. Now, I got to tell you, the person who's about to step in the ring today, I'm not so sure I want to fight with him. So we're just going to, we're going to chill in the, in the ring today. We're not, you know, um, actually I, I say it with a, jokingly, but in all seriousness, this guy's a fighter, a uh, fighter amongst fighters. You are in for a, an amazing story today and lessons. We're going to talk about psychology, marketing psychology lessons learned in a place that most of you would never think you learn uh, amazing marketing psychology lessons in prison. Right. And if you actually take a step back, th- can you think about the amount of life lessons that could be learned in prison? I mean, it is an it is an intense environment where you are always on, you know, the alert. Um, and, and we're going to learn about that today. The reason I want to do story today, when you know, in this podcast, I almost never allow our guests to do too much story um, is because this particular story deserves to be told, needs to be told, needs to be heard. Uh, the episode title is three marketing psychology lessons learned in prison that they'll never teach you in Harvard. <laughs> and it's super true. Um, I'm, I'm excited. I'm, I really am very excited. Now, before I get into the introduction of our guest and before all of that fun stuff, remember, if you're listening to us on, on YouTube, what do you got to do? You got to hit subscribe right now. You got to smash that, uh, that uh, I don't know, the like button, thumbs up like button, bell icon. Leave me a comment below. Leave our guest a comment. Say something. We read them. We love them. Thank you very much for them. If you're on iTunes, make sure you leave us a great review. It helps us climb the rankings. We're trying to do that still. All right. We want to get into the top 20 now. Um, and any other podcast, you know, wherever platform you're on, hit subscribe, leave a review. Onicpodcast.com is where you can get to see our new website. It's up. I like it. <laughs> I can't say I love, love it, but we're getting there. It's been a lot of work, man. My team, thank you guys. And we are going to just, we're going to keep escalating that thing. It's going to become epic over the next months to come. And then of course, learn.com, L-U-R-N.com. Get your butt over there as soon as you can. Join the revolution, all right? The revolution being led by entrepreneurs. Let's face it, look, (laughs) entrepreneurs are going to be the ones that change the world. You've seen what our government does. What is it capable of? Tell me. Now, what are we capable of? So L-U-R-N.com, lots of amazing things coming out. All right, enough marketing, enough promos. Let's get to the point. Today's guest, his name is Zach Babcock. And this gentleman and I met. We still haven't met yet face-to-face, but we met virtually. He reached out to me, and I'm going to be very honest, he doesn't know this story, but he reached out to me. I think someone introduced us, or I think it was an introduction. And it was like, hey, man, I want to have you on my podcast. So every time someone reaches out to me that way, I'm like, ugh. You know, I just... Honest to God, I don't have time. Like, there's no time on my schedule. I'm not looking for PR. I'm not looking for organic clout. I, I don't care to be on other people's podcasts. I barely have time to film my own, right? And um, so I had this like this this a hole approach in my head where I was like, not this again. But then one thing led to another, and there was something about him. I ended up clicking something. I ended up reading something, or it was something he wrote, and I saw the word prison come up. Now, you got, obviously that creates intrigue, right? Uh, I would be lying if I didn't say like, huh, prison, what? And then I started reading about him and I listened to a couple of his podcast episodes. He doesn't know this. And I fell in love with the guy. I was like, you know what? This, this person right here, this, he just, it needs, like, you got to spread the love here. You got to spread his message. And so I was like, yeah, I'm in, man. I'll do the episode. And we've been planning it for well over a year. And I still haven't been on his episode we, were, we had epic plans and then COVID happened, but I'm glad that he's on ours. Now, he spent five years in prison and from that he came out and he is literally scaling businesses, helping people scale their businesses, himself, multiple six figures. And I love it. I love that. You know, he came out and didn't let anyone else in the world tell him what he can and cannot do. Took charge of his own life, turned it around and just doing epic stuff and now is giving back to the community and helping others do it too. So I'm really excited to hear about it. 
Uh, and in case you're wondering, yes, I am going to ask him why he was in prison. It's going to be a part of the episode. I've been wanting to ask him for a year, and I always told him, nope, I'm going to ask you live on the on the podcast. I want to know the whole story. And, and he said he was an open book, which, again, I love even more. So I uh, love having him here. Zach, man, thanks so much for being on this episode. I, I am so excited to hear from you. Onik, dude. Like I said, man, I couldn't. I've been licking my chops for this one. Super excited to be here. Thanks for having me, man. Yeah, man. Um, I, I love I, I just love the story. I know some of it. I don't know all of it and hope we find out a lot more about it today. Uh, Zach, we do have a tradition here at The Fighting Entrepreneur, and that is to raise your right hand and repeat after me. Yes, sir. Isaac, Isaac Babcock. Isaac Babcock. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. To tell the truth and nothing but the truth. To tell the truth and nothing but the truth. I don't know why I'm laughing. I feel like every time I do this, I start laughing lately. Um, and what are you going to reveal? And reveal all the reveal all the truths behind my story and reveal all the truths behind my story <laughs> that could get dangerous <laughs> all right thanks man um zach uh, dude I, i'm gonna shut up and turn it over to you you know the usual questions man i know you get them what'd you do why were you in prison how'd you get there what was your life like tell us the story like it's such a cool story to see how you've turned it around i'm gonna shut up i'm gonna let you talk man go for it right on man i'll keep it you know Cliff Notes version, we can always dig deeper, man. I, you know, I get a pod, I got a podcast too. And when somebody starts rambling for 20, 30 minutes, it's like face palm. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, man, did over, did over five years of my life in prison. Did that, uh, didn't have any chief aim in life. I grew up without a father figure, not making any excuses. I just wanted to fit in with other people. I didn't know what it was like to be a man. I was trying to in search of what that was um, and made a lot of poor decisions in the process. Uh, got sentenced to a seven year sentence. Did four years straight, got out for two years, and then I went back to prison just 20 days before my twin sons were born. Dude, that was the, the, the proverbial shawl that broke the camel's back. Said, I'm going to own the rest of my life. I got out, became an entrepreneur, got laughed at for three and a half years, launched a podcast, Underdog Empowerment. It took off right out the gate. That was like the first dose of real success I had. And uh, just been killing it ever since, been able to generate hundreds of thousands of dollars from the podcast. And I help other entrepreneurs do the same. And now, man, I'm just like, just in love with life, man, because I'm scaling the business. But now I literally spend 12 to 4 p.m. Monday through Friday in the business. And then I get to spend all the time I want with my kids, with my wife and my spirituality, working on my health, like really living life, not just business. So it's been a blast. It's been awesome. And I'm excited about it. Man, I love that. 12 to 4 p.m. I, I got to I got to take notes because mine is currently 11 to 5. Um, and sometimes it gets stretched 11 to 6. But I like this. I want to go. I want to go to 12 to 4. That's epic. So, yeah, let's dig deeper, man. I mean, you talk about kind of a rough upbringing. And I think there's a lot of people in the world, and especially a lot of people listening that could could relate. Right. It, different people have different ways of having a rough upbringing. Um, I can't say I can. I, I do have to say that I'm always fascinated by it, but I, I was one of the blessed ones. I mean, I had, I had an amazing family, parents who brought me up, and I have all the more respect for someone like yourself who didn't have that. So talk about that. And how did, like, how old were you, by the way, when you got sentenced to prison? I was 19 years old uh, when I got sentenced. So I had been in, in and out of juveniles and boys' homes and detention centers my entire youth from nine to that point. I'd probably maybe spent like three years total from age nine to, to 19, like free, um, maybe four, but it was always in and out for like little six months here, a year here, 120 days there. Um, and, you know, I always had good intentions. It was just, man, it really came down to, I wanted to fit in so bad. And so I, I would wanted to be accepted so much. And we all do, you know what I mean? That's like wired into our psychology from like our primitive days. Right. But I guess maybe I wanted it more than like your average person. And um, that led to a lot of poor decisions. I wasn't staying true to myself and I never had any chief aim in life. So, man, that, that, that's, that's amazing and, and not a good way, right? Obviously, since nine years old, you said till nine to 19, that's 10 years, maybe up to four years of which you actually were in freedom. So kind of the writing was on the wall in, in so many ways, like you just, things were not looking good. What was it? Like when you say you wanted to get accepted, was it gangs that you got into? Was it drug related matters? Like what was the path that that wanting to get accepted took you down? Yeah. So my sister uh, that passed away, she was three and a half years older than me and she hung out with all older friends as well. 
And so I'm nine years old, hanging out with 15 and 16 year olds, smoking weed. Um, you know, and it, I didn't start the heavier drugs until way later on, like, uh, I don't know, uh, probably like the heavier, heavier drugs, like in seven, 17, 18 and stuff. But I was smoking weed and not going to school that whole time. That's the reason why I was getting locked up for truancy and for, uh, you know, dirty urines because I was on probation. Got it. Was it eventually drug related things that took you to prison or did, did drugs then lead to like violence and gangs? Like, I guess it's a it, it could become a slippery slope. But yeah, in your case, what finally led to that that the prison sentence? Yeah. So, you know, this better than anyone, you know, what you believe about yourself is true. And so it's that your identity. And so you're going to act in accordance with that. And so, no, it wasn't the drugs that led to prison. We were out one night being stupid. We were 17 years old. Uh, we didn't even, I was never poor. We, we, we had, we never went without, you know, we were never poor. We grew up in Ferguson, Missouri. Um, but we are, it wasn't like the greatest neighborhood, but it wasn't the worst. You know what I'm saying? Uh, but we went out one night, we were, it was me and three other friends and we were bored and we just were stealing from cars. And then some cars would leave the garage door opener and we'd open that up, go hit some other cars, come back 20 minutes. If there was power tools and stuff in the garage, we'd take that. Uh, and then we ended up getting caught for that the next night. And then I took the case for everybody. And when I got that case, I thought that my life was over. I was like, I'm going to prison for the rest of my life. Didn't know I was only going to get probation, but I was like, I'm going to go to prison for the rest of my life. It's over. I ruined my life. Might as well just go down the deep end. And then that quickly escalated to all the other drugs. Dude, and it went from, you know, weed to, to ecstasy to coke, 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 cocaine, uh, uh, crack heroin, you name it. I was going off the deep end, dude. Wow. Well, listen, I mean, first of all, thank you for sharing and thank you for being open about that. I can't imagine that being easy. And um, but at the same time, I feel like a lot of that's probably led to who you are today. Um, and so I'm excited to find out about that and that transformation. So I want to know I want to know a couple of areas. First is you're going down this massive slippery slope in life, right? Which is now ending with you in prison. And most people think of going to prison as not necessarily a redemptive thing. I mean, from what we hear from media, pe most people go to prison and get worse, right? That's like one of the things you hear the most about, like, hey, it's not corrective. Um, in some countries, maybe it is. They actually compare U.S. prison systems to other countries and say like the U.S. prison system just brews worse things. It doesn't make things better. For you, it did. Can you walk me through like, I want to talk about your time in prison in a minute, just because I'm actually personally curious. You, I only hear what I hear, but I can't help but jump forward. Like, at what point did you say, dude, I have to turn things around? Like, what was it that led to that? It, dude, there was a bunch of events in life that played a part to that final thing that, that you know, flipped the switch. But that, that exact moment that you're talking about is when I went back to prison just 20 days before my twin sons were born. And I'll tell you exactly what happened, man. I grew up, you know, without a dad and always wanting to be accepted by other people in search of what being a man even meant. Um, and then I couldn't wait to be a dad. I used to play football uh, and I used to watch all my friends' dads at practice there. And I used to, you know, wonder how that felt. And I couldn't, you know, wait to experience that. I couldn't wait to be that for my own kids because I didn't have that in life. So I was searching for what I didn't have, I guess. And when I when I got locked up just 20 days before they were there, my twin sons were born, that was like so painful, like the worst experience I've ever felt in my life. But it was the best thing that could ever happen to me. Cause right then and there, my identity shift. I, I literally said I woke up from a blackout induced uh, alcohol induced blackout. I was like, man, this isn't who I am. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a good dad. I'm a good, I'm a good human. Like I'm going to get back home and do whatever it takes. Like, I don't know what I got to do to get back home and be happy and successful, but I know my identity is being in my kid's life and being there. And so that was that moment for me. So you were back in prison at that point for another year. Did you end up going back for a, for a year? So I ended up doing eight months. <clears throat> I didn't know how long I was going to do because I had anywhere from, I had a year and a half left on my sentence. So they could have held me for a year and a half, but I knew it was going to be anywhere from six months to a year and a half. I ended up doing eight months. So, Okay, good. So it was a shorter time of that. Now during the time, so let's talk about your first time you were in prison and we'll talk about the second time. And then I really want to get into what happened post-prison because that leads to where you are today. And um, obviously the time you spent in prison is what led to these the marketing psychology or the things that you ended up using in your entrepreneurial career. What is prison like? 
Um, and during that first four years, we'll compare. It's almost like two. We'll compare your first four years to the, to the second, that eight-month period. But yeah, what was the first four years like? So it's not like what you think it is, as what it's portrayed like on TV and stuff. It's very similar, but it's not it's not that. All right. And, and so there is like a lot of that crazy stuff that does happen that you see on TV, like in lockup or whatever, but it, it's, it's like normal life, but the best way to explain it is to give an analogy. Like, you know how you go out into a store and people are like smiling sometimes, or it might say hi or hold the door open for you. And, you know, common courtesy. And, you know, if you have something interesting, somebody might ask you about that. If you're out at a bar or something, None of that happens in prison. Everybody walks around with a frown on their face, minds their own business, doesn't smile, doesn't hold doors open. Well, you can hold doors open. That's common respect, but it's not like a happy go lucky place. And there's no, there's no women. If you're in a men's prison, you know, there's a couple women COs, but you don't really talk to them and, and stuff like that. So it's, it's, it's quite different. It's just like, Hey, mind your own business, you know, stand on your own, you know, and uh, make sure you're respectful and you also don't let nobody disrespect you. So, so it's, but you also said at some level, it's not like you're constantly walking around looking over your back with like, cause that's how it's portrayed to the rest of us, right? Like, I feel like you go to prison, you pretty much, you know, have to walk around with your, with the eye at the back of your head. Cause you're going to get attacked at any minute. And, you know, so I've always thought, like, how can you actually improve yourself as a person? Like, if you're always worried about, like, basically being killed. Um, and I got to say, like, every show you watch, every media thing you get in, in front of, like, that's how they make it look. So during that time, you're saying you do have time to yourself to study, to to think, to improve, or and you're not constantly just looking out for yourself? Yeah, so you do have to walk around with an eye in the back of your head, but it's not like you got to fear for your life unless you're in, like, a specific security level prison. I wasn't at the super max high level security prison. I wasn't there with the lifers and stuff. And a lot of times it's not like that there either, but there is times where it does go down where there's prison riots or people stabbing people over like a bad deal. But it is like psychological warfare every single minute, 24 seven, where people are trying to get over on you. Um, not everyone, there are some good, a lot of good people in there, but there's also a lot of you know, people that are just gone that aren't coming back. And it's sad mm -hmm. to say, but it is what it is, you know? So yeah, it, it it's just not as intensified as TV would put it. Got it. Well, as is true with everything, right? Uh, I, I love asking, uh, I have a lot of doctors in the family. I don't know if you noticed I'm Indian. So that's what we, well, my family, half of them are doctors. So I always go to them and say, Hey, is it like, uh, is it like the TV? And they always laugh and say, no. Um, but okay. So this, Second period of eight months, you went in as a new man. You said you went in, you're like, whoa, I'm done with this life. This is not who I am. How were you different in that second eight months in prison versus the first four years? Like what was what what did you do differently? Yeah, dude. <laughs> I'll tell you what, that eight months, that second time felt a hundred times longer than that four years I did the first mm -hmm. time. Just because I'm sitting there the first first month and a half, I'm trying to imagine what my kids look like. Uh, yeah. Just because, you know, I'm waiting for pictures to get sent in and it takes time to go through the mail system. And yeah, it was, uh, you know, time was just like, man, because I couldn't wait to get out. But it was very similar in the sense of like vision is everything. Like the first time I went in, I was 19 and my vision was I'm going to get a bunch of tattoos, come out ripped and all this stuff. And and that's exactly what happened. You know, I created that mm -hmm. vision that I thought about all day long. Second time I was visualizing how I was going to get out and be in my kid's life and be able to provide for my family, my, my now wife, girlfriend at the time. And uh, it was crazy, dude, because the Fer Ferguson situation with Michael Brown happened at that when I went in the second time and I'm from Ferguson, Missouri. And so I'm, I'm out in the yard and they're like, hey, man, your city's on fire. And I'm like, what are you talking about, man? And so I went into the cell and I put on the TV, you know, we had TVs and stuff in our cell. And, uh, and I put it on CNN and I see it and it's like, you know, the, the town's burning and all this stuff. And I was like, oh crap, you know, and I ran and called my mom, make sure she was okay. And, you know, she told me it was, it wasn't as crazy as the news was put it obviously, but, uh, you know, that she was being safe and, and that she was, you know, being cautious about it. So anyways, my, my whole thing was like, man, I know I'm not going to be able to get a job when I get out because I experienced that, experienced that my last time when I got out, I put myself in that position and I know that's going to be held over my head for the rest of my life. And I was like, man, I've always been an entrepreneur, even though I didn't know what entrepreneur was at the time. But I've always, my whole entire life, sold Pokemon cards, sold Wii when I was a kid, you know, like all this stuff, right? Um, and so I knew 
that I was going to have to go into business some way, shape or form. And my idea was to get I Heart Ferguson on a t-shirt and on wristbands because I had a lot of experience going door to door and sell it door to door. That's a hell of a business model, by the way. <laughs> and it never happened, but I was just thinking of ways to get out and how I was going to be able to provide and be in my kid's life and be happy. Well, yeah, but that, that's huge, man. I mean, what a different way of showing up every day in between the two, right? Four months, it's all about you. It's your tattoos. It's your body. It's you getting buff. It's you, 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 you. Your second eight months, the biggest thing is it's not about you anymore. It's about your kids. It's about your now wife. It's about your family. It's about you running and calling your mom to see if she's okay. Um, and I feel like a lot of people listening, I talk about this, right? Like I wrote about it in my book, Escape, where I talk about external accountability. And that when you have that external accountability, when there's a reason for you to do it or do something other than yourself, it's, it's amazing. You know, um, for me, getting married was a huge, huge, huge change. I mean, if you look at my wealth, and if you just track my wealth, um, it's, it's almost like my wife was like the most, like best luck charm I could have ever had in my life. And, and of course she was, she's amazing, but it's also, I think different. We make decisions differently. Like I couldn't be rogue anymore because it's like, I have a family not to provide for. So amazing. I love that. And I, and I really want someone who's listening to this part of the story to take away. What is your external accountability? Like, who are you doing this for? If it's just for you, you're going to make more mistakes and you're going to be more rogue and take chances. And, um, wow. Very powerful. So I love the fact that in, in prison, you recognize the fact that entrepreneurship would be the way. Um, I couldn't help but chuck, chuckle a little because I've said this before and I almost feel like it's wrong to say, but man, I'll say it with you and I, you know, we'll, we can have a discussion about it. But it's, it's almost like if you've had a rough, rough life on the streets, like there is part of you that's just entrepreneurial. Like at least there's some lessons and some things you, you are, you're better shaped to be an entrepreneur because you've just dealt with the rejection, the problems, the object, uh, obstacles, challenges, and you hustle, which really just translates into later on, you, you don't take no for an answer. You sell. Like, I guess it's, you kind of touched that on that a little bit. Do you feel like some of that hardship time prepared you better to be an entrepreneur? I like I say this with the most, uh, humble, humility of all. Like, I, I mean that I'm not a, I'm not a, I'm not an arrogant or cocky dude. I'm very confident, but I'm not cocky or arrogant, but dude, there's nothing that entrepreneurship can throw at me that I can't take just from my experience of what yeah. I went through. Like, and, I, and I believe you. Yeah. I'm blessed yeah. in that, in that fact, dude. Like, and, and there's, I'm not saying that it's easy cause it's not, no, it's not easy building a business and there's a lot of new skills and things that I had to learn and continue to learn. And, so much more growth that I'm going to continue to to go through, but there's no like thing that's going to be able to be thrown at me. That's going to stop me. And, and that, that is powerful. I mean, talk about, talk about taking something that was a negative and I put quotes around it because you know, everyone, I, I don't know, really know if we have a negative in our life. It, it all shapes who we are. If we're bad today, then everything that happened to us was negative. But if we're great today, then everything that happened to us was positive. But, um, you took that negative, you repositioned it, right? And you're like, well, what can I take away from that? What can I learn from that? What can I, what's the silver lining in a, in a time I was selling drugs, right? Like, what, what, well, let's break down what was good in that. Like, what can I take from that? Someone asked me once, and, and I'm reminded of you just as I kind of think about this story. Someone asked me once, I, I was at a point in my business where I was like a week, week and a half away from having to shut it down. And uh, there was like one project left and thankfully it took off and, you know, we didn't have to go that route. But Someone asked me once during an interview, they said, well, what were you thinking during that time where you knew there was only seven, eight, nine days left for your business? And I remember telling him, I said, I was thinking about the time that I was on my hospital bed being wheeled into a surgery and they told me I had a 50-50 chance of waking up from it. And I was like, you know what? I woke up. If I could survive that, I sure as hell could survive this. And so kind of reminds me of your story, right? Where you've been in places that are so much darker and so much worse than when entrepreneurship throws you a challenge, you're like, oh, whatever right? I've survived much worse than this. Um, you said something and I want to probe about it. You said, Hey, I knew I wasn't going to get a job when I came out of prison. Can you talk a little bit about that? Like coming out of prison and, and, and what does it look like? How do, what do you do? Like, what do your friends do? I know you went towards entrepreneurship, but what do other people do that leave prison? How do you make a living? Man, it's, it sucks, dude. So I'm so glad you, it doesn't suck. It's a, it's a great opportunity. I had to reframe that, but, um, Dude, I'm I, this, so I'm really passionate about this. Every not everything that I do is aligned now, and it's all like I know this 
gets thrown out there so much and it's like, man, here we go again. But like, dude, I'm so crystal clear on like my passions and my purpose in life. And so like my purpose, my passions is mastering the art of mastery itself. My purpose is helping people do the same thing. And my ultimate legacy goal is a 9% recidivism rate nationwide in the U.S. And so if you look at the recidivism rates in the U.S. What's, what's recidivism? That's a big word for me, my friend. Yeah. So it's like within three years, does someone come back to prison or not after being released? Oh, okay. All right. Yeah. And so, and they're different in each state, but if you look at them, they're astronomically high compared to any country and the U S dwarfs everything. And so it's a clear indicator that the system's broken. It's a, it's a garbage system. And I'm not making excuses for people that go to prison because, Hey, you put yourself in that position, but, or I don't want to say, but, but, I hate saying but because it's like and it just negates everything you just said before. Kind of. <laughs> oh, you're good, man. Go for it. There is people that can come out like I'm a living example. I'm not the only one. There's people that come out and, and change their life. What, what I want to focus on is a better way because there is a way better way. Like the, 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 the programs you go through when you're coming out of prison are complete, utter bullshit, dude. Like they are like they're a complete waste of taxpayer dollars. They don't help you for one. They're taught by people you can't resonate for two. And then you got to be, you got to figure out a way to get to these classes when you don't even have income to provide for yourself and your family. And so you're trying to catch bus money and all this stuff when you could be out trying to find a job where you can't even find a job anyways, because society says, oh, once you're a convicted felon, you're X out of all a whole lot of opportunities as far as like careers go. So if you're cut out to be an entrepreneur, then yeah, it's a great thing for you. But if you're not, because not everybody is, it's kind of really tough. And so we're, we're, we're hyperly focused on, on that aspect of it by developing life skills that aren't taught in our, even in, even in our uh, school systems, but matching people up with their strengths for people that aren't cut out to be entrepreneurs with other entrepreneurs we're connected with getting them jobs there. And then people that are, we have programs to help them uh, become an entrepreneur. That's the next brand and phase that I'm launching that I've been talking about for the last two years and I'm licking my chops about. Dude, I, I have chills right now. I love that you're doing that. And um, wow, what a service. And you just said something. You're like, the government's not going to do it. You know me. You heard me, right? When I did the introduction of the podcast, I'm like, I think I'm pretty clear how I feel about the government. Um, and just every week, more and more, I realize how absolutely inefficient and ridiculous the government is. Um, and so it's up to us. I said, the entrepreneurs will change the world. There you are. I mean, if you achieve what you just said, man, and you have changed lives. Like, uh, talk about the trickle effect of that. So there's something I want to put on your radar and I want to commit right now publicly on this podcast to, it's probably still a little bit further away. It's likely a 2022 project for me. Um, I have a very deep heart for the, for veterans, uh, especially veterans that have been injured um, on, on, in the, you know, in their duty. Cause I feel like I owe them everything. I owe my whole freedom to them. And, um, and also for the disabled, um, and there's been something I've been working on in my mind so far, and it'll come out soon, is a program that teaches them different marketing skills. Um, it would be basically going through and getting an education on like social media or copywriting or media buying, because I find these are all skills that can be taught and that you can earn a lot of money doing. And you don't necessarily, you know, you don't have to be mobile in case you're injured or you don't have to, you could be virtual and you, you could do a, you could be a contractor, so you don't have to get a payroll job. When I create that program, I'd love to be able to share it with you, partner with you, and help bring that to the individuals that you have access to. Because I really feel like there's a lot to be done there. So kudos to you for doing that I, and uh, being part of your mission. That's that's amazing, man. Dude, really thank you. I appreciate you, dude, for offering that, man. That's stand up what you believe in as well, man. Much love, and much respect. Wow. That's awesome. All right, so you came out. Um, you knew right from the get go even during your last eight months there, um, you know, before you will keep talking about the story, but like, what are the three psychology marketing psychology lessons that you learned in prison? Walk me through now you're out the next, you're out eight months is over. Obviously you've not gone back. So think something good happened. Um, what happened after that? How did you have this like new Zach, Zach 2.0 came out and what was he like? And what are the lessons you learned? Yeah. So I'll, I'll go, I'll go to a quick, uh, a quick lesson that I learned in prison. Um, as far as marketing goes. So I used to, I used to write uh, tickets in there. So what I mean by that, we, we'd have sports tickets, you know, like the football games or basketball or baseball, whatever, you know, we had, we had access to TV and so we could watch ESPN and all that. 
And um, just like in Vegas, you know, where they had the lines, we'd have, you know, the ticket man that would back the ticket. He would have like the, he'd buy all the groceries, like the cigarettes or the honey buns or, you know, the soups and all that stuff. And people could, he could make the ticket man could go and find the lines in the newspapers that we had access to. And then he can make his the same as those or switches up to whatever he wanted it to be. And then he'd put a ticket out and people could bet on those tickets and they can put up, you know, a honey bun. And if you hit it, pay back double. Um, there was a bunch of different stuff. So I used to write tickets and I'd get a percentage for everything that I wrote. And so how I would generate more, uh, ticket sales for, uh, essentially to, to write tickets, to, to make more money, is I would be, I would put off this non-neediness uh, vibe. Like I wasn't desperate for you to write a ticket with me. I'd even joke with people and be like, dude, you ain't never going to hit. Why do you keep on writing with me? You keep losing your money every time. And it'd make them want to write even more because it's something <laughs> that they enjoy doing, you know, and uh, stuff like that, you know, because if you're, you get it, you know, if you're all like desperate and needy, like in a relationship with a, with a girl, or if you're a girl and anytime you're desperate and needy for the other person, whenever you're dating, it puts the other person off. You're like, Oh no, I don't want you're, you're needy. You're desperate. And they run. If you play a game of tag, the person that's it, you're running from the person that's chasing you. So anytime you chase, you lose. It's what a lesson that I learned uh, in there. That's one of them though. I use that in uh, marketing a lot. I'm pretty, I know you yeah, have I, seen your copy. I, I just wrote the title of your next book. It's called honey bun profits. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I love that, man. I just, I, I, I love the lesson, first of all, but just to pick, the, it's so crazy. We as humans, I, I always just bow to how we can adapt to every environment. Like, you're the ticket man, and, and the rewards are honey buns. Like, that's awesome. Like, we do with what we have, and we create, and, and then there's a massive lesson to be learned in that, which is don't be desperate. Don't chase after. You learned one of the key lessons in sales writing tickets based off of honey buns. Like how cool, it doesn't get any cooler than that. So I just wanted to take a minute to really just enjoy that. That's funny. Awesome. I love it. All right. Yes. Agreed. Uh, it's kind of like the takeaway sale too, right? Where you're just like, ah, not for you. You can't do this. And then person just comes running after you saying, I, what do you mean? I can't, I, of course I can. Um, works every time, by the way, works every time. Yeah. All right. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, keep going, man. That was awesome. Cool, man. Uh, there's a, there's a ton of them, man. But all right. So another one would be um, like, as far as positioning goes, um, you don't position yourself in a weak position unless, unless it's someone like that's stronger than you. And you know that if you try to position yourself that's stronger than them, it would, it would damage. So, so for an example, um, we all have, we all have uh, bad things that happen in our lives. You know, none of our lives are perfect, but you look on social media and it's nothing but a highlight reel a lot of times. And so mm -hmm. what, what I learned in prison, and I also do this in real life, is that I don't like showcase current like struggles that I'm going through because anytime somebody sees somebody struggling, they scatter like roaches. But I do showcase whenever I'm wrong and whenever I learn from that. And like stuff that happened maybe a couple of weeks ago or a week ago. And the lesson I learned from it may not showcase it as I'm going through it. And so I do the same thing in prison. Like, they're, like, dude, I'm not a, I'm not a, a, a hardcore fighter. Like I can fight, but like I'm, I'm probably around average, you know, I'm not like weak, but I'm not like a stone cold with my hands and in prison fights do happen. And, you know, I've had gotten in fights in prison because I had to, especially when you first get there, you got to prove yourself. And if, as long as you, even if you aren't a good fighter, as long as you stand up and fight, people won't mess with you after that, unless you like do something for them to mess with you. But uh, they won't just try and pick on you and like you're a target or nothing. They come at you when you first there to see if you're a pushover or not. And so I would, in marketing, like whenever, whenever I'm positioning myself on social media, I'll demonstrate win after win after win after win because it builds that momentum and that hype and that buzz and people want to get behind that. They want to grab on your coattail and they want to be a part of that. And then whenever I do have stuff that, that like, for example, last week, I learned the lesson that, hey, man, I got to fund my reserve accounts more because we had a situation come up where I just moved out here to Wentzville, Missouri, 45 minutes out of St. Louis. 
and I'm still paying 1100 a month on my old house for rent. And we got to renovate that old house before we, we don't have to pay rent on it no more. And so I just signed the contract for 15K with the contractor to come and renovate the whole house. And then we had a couple of chargebacks that hit for numerous of different reasons. And I was like, holy crap, this payroll is coming up. And for me personally, the worst, the, the hardest thing for me about entrepreneurship is knowing that I have other families that I'm responsible for to feed. And what bothers me more than anything is to ever be late on that. And so we were in a bad position where we almost weren't able to run payroll in time. I had to, I had to jump back into sales mode to generate that revenue. And so this is me talking about it that happened last week now because we made it through it. I didn't talk about it during it, but now I'm talking about the lesson. So anyways, I'll quit talking for so long, but the lesson is demonstrate your wins as you're winning and demonstrate your losses to show that you are human, but don't talk about your struggle necessarily as you're going through it. But there are situational times where you can, and that's kind of another rabbit hole that we could go down. I love that lesson. Powerful. And you know what I love the most about that lesson is, you know, it's an honest lesson because most people would never say that. It feels almost like the PD market would be like, no, 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 no. Let's be honest about our struggles. Let's be. And you know what? Maybe, but it's all BS because people don't perceive you right. People don't look at you right. You're 100% right. I've come to learn even in my own personal life and professional life, come at everything as you can with a position of strength. Um, that doesn't mean you abuse it. You come in with a position of strength and do good by it. But anytime you come in from the, a different position, um, you're right. It's just you, you're, you are yourself devaluing yourself. Um, I went back and looked at some of my own social media posts. Uh, I did this about a couple of months, a few months ago, actually. And I said, you know what? Let's go back and scroll through the last couple of years worth of posts because it'll tell me what I portrayed myself as. And I actually didn't really enjoy it. I didn't like it. I was like, there's this, this is not actually even who I am. Like I was picking random weird times to talk and say random things, get involved in conversations, have arguments about stupid things that I quite frankly don't even care that much about. Um, and I love it. I just think uh, you made a really strong point there, which is, hey, when you make a post or you talk to someone, are you coming at it? Are you are you highlighting the good stuff? And are you coming at it from a place of strength? Uh, very powerful. All right, number three. And then um, I want to ask you some some questions about that actual what it looked like timeline wise for you coming out of uh, out of prison. Absolutely, man. Uh, number three, man, I'm going to pick this one would be. This is this is something that for me, because of my core values, I don't like uh, this is something that, you you know, if you're a bad person, you can use this and exploit it and do bad stuff with. But if you're a good person, you can use it and do good stuff with. That's with everything in life to be if we're being honest. Yeah. But um, it's making someone feel smarter and better than you, giving them that feeling, a sense of worth and power to get them to take action to influence them to to do what it is that you're trying to help help them to do. So I use so I I would I'll give the example of when I use it in prison and then I'll give an example when I how I use it in my marketing. So in prison if there are people that were like more powerful in a sense it could be anything. Maybe they had more connections in there. Maybe they had, you know, maybe they were stronger physically, a better fighter or they had, you know, a uh, uh, stuff that I wanted as far as like a, a, a locker full of food and, you know, they were the ticket man or whatever, you know, there's so many different situations. I would make them feel smarter and in control and uh, better. And I would make myself look perceived weaker or whatnot than, than what I really was. A lot of times I'd do that to avoid conflict because I didn't want to get in trouble and I wanted to come home too. So it was like it's psychological warfare there. Um, and so that you can I, that translates to where um, sometimes you know I'm talking on a sales call or, so, or talking to someone and persuading someone. I'm always pers everybody's we're always persuading our kids or wife or whoever. We're always in persuasion mode, right? And so uh, I'll do that where sometimes like a prospective client will say something that's completely bull bullshit. Like, can you yeah, sorry? Can you cuss on your podcast? <laughs> we don't as much, but it's okay. No problem. That that's a softer one. All right, I'll, I'll watch it, but completely BS. <laughs> and and it's like a limiting belief. And I can't say like, no, that's a limiting belief or whatever, because then it would just kill the, kill the sale. But I'm like, yeah, I kind of get what you're saying, man. But uh, And so if that's the case and you're, you know, like you said, you wanted to become this, because I'll refer back to something that they said. And I'll say, like you said, because everybody wants to stay consistent with what they commit to publicly, um, then, you know, that kind of brings it back and it kind of helps 
persuade them into the direction I want to go. And I only do this though, if it's someone that I think it's a legit client that we can help because, you know, there's, there's tons where I just will put like, no, you know, I won't even go into this, but if it's someone that I think I can help, then yeah, I'm going to do everything in my power to persuade them to come on only if they're all in after we get done with the conversation. So anyways, I started going into some other stuff too. Love that, man. Love it. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, uh, how hard would you work to persuade someone if you had the cure to cancer in your hand and they had cancer? You know, it's like, mm. how hard would you work? And at what point would you not fighting for that person be a lack of character versus the other way around? And this is how I've always looked at sales and persuasion. If I really believe in what I've got, then I'm not doing you a service unless I try my best to get it in your hands. Um, yeah. It's when I do bad with that power in which you addressed in the beginning that it gets bad. If I do not believe in what I have and I give it all I've got to get it in your hands, well, then I'm just a bad person. So, you know, that's, that's a different topic. Um, so what, what will, uh, walk me down the timeline. What was the year that you got out of prison the second time? We're in 2021 right now, as we film this, when, when, when did you get out and what the next few years look like? I got out two days after my 26th birthday. And it was on my wife's, she was my girlfriend at the time on her 26th birthday on October 2nd of 2014. Um, wow. Yeah, it was, it's crazy. Our birthdays are two days apart. And wow. I got out on her birthday and my kids are, my, my boys are eight months old. My stepdaughter, she's four and a half. Um, and it was all good, except for like, okay, now it's time to perform. Now it's time to go out and make it happen. And I spent the next you know month and a half trying to find a job couldn't find anything anywhere. I was looking even for under the pain, uh, under the table paying jobs, like a, like a bar back or, you know, construction or something. Cause I knew it was going to be extremely hard to find a job and I wasn't having any luck anywhere, man. And so I dipped and dabbed with network marketing for two years, had some success with it, almost got to 2000 a month residual income. Uh, cause I was super hungry with it, but that just wasn't my thing. And then I started moving into to what I'm doing now in the beginning of 2017. And so in 2017, how did you find your way into, was it network marketing that kind of introduced you to the world of internet marketing? Was that like the, the pathway that took you to, to this world? Yeah, man. Like, so I, like I mentioned, I've always been an entrepreneur. Dude, I used to be in a rap group in my teens and I used to be in the group. I wasn't even the best rapper in the group, but I was the business one. I was the one, the guy that booked the studio time, that booked the shows, hustled the tickets and made it happen. Uh, you know, my first job was McDonald's and I quit halfway through because it just wasn't for me. And then I did all door to door sales shops. So I've always, I, dude, I sold t-shirts before I went to prison. It's always been, you know, business with me. I just didn't know what entrepreneur was, but network marketing was the thing that it was like a a college to entrepreneurship for me. It got my feet wet and, and showed me what was possible. Uh, most don't know this. For, same for me, by the way. So I was a financial planner in college the first couple of years, but I worked for an organization called World Financial Group, and they focus a lot on the build your team aspect of things. So I got all my certifications and I was actually doing financial planning, um, but I also had a team under me. It was definitely network marketing. And for me, it was where I learned to speak on speak in front of people, it's where I learned the concept of sales. It's I just, you know, blossomed me into an entrepreneur. So um, I don't want to do network marketing anymore, but I think it's got its own place. I think sometimes it gets a bad rep. And I've, that, for me, it was, a, it was a stepping stone. And that's why I asked the question if it was for you as well. Um, Zach, as we kind of round, dude, I could, I, could, I could honestly sit here with you for an entire day and more, and we could keep going. And, and maybe one of these days we will. When you come down here to to film for yours. I think we're going to do a follow-up and we're going to do one of those, like literally sit on a couch and I'm going to come up with the craziest questions for you um, and ask stuff. But um, there's a lot of people right now that feel like maybe what you felt like when you left prison. Um, maybe they're not in an actual prison or leaving an actual prison. Quite a few might be actually. Some might just be down and out, lost their jobs. I mean, we're in a weird place right now with COVID. I mean, look at how many local businesses are just getting absolutely uprooted left and right. There are people that have that same pit feeling where it's over. What do I do? Nobody wants to give me an opportunity. Nothing is working for me. I've ruined my life. These are, these are messages that I find to be far more prevalent and popular in people's minds than we would ever want to accept or admit. What do you say to them? Like of all things, like talk to them right now directly. What would you say to someone like that? You, me, and everybody in the world, we all have everything that we need right now to be and become. 
Like you have everything right now to be and become. Think about that. I'm going to say it one more time. You have everything right now to be and become whatever it is that you want to be. So there's going to be things in life that happen that you don't have any control over. COVID, all right? Your sister dying in, in prison while you're in, in the hole in an eight by 10 cell. <laughs> any, there's going to be things that you can't control. However, it, one thing, one freedom that you always have that nobody on the face of this earth can ever take away from you is your freedom to choose how you respond to whatever happens to you. So you can choose to be down and out and give up and throw in the towel and quit being a fighting entrepreneur when COVID happens, when, when these restrictions get laid down on us. Or you could choose to rise up like a fighting entrepreneur would rise up and do the next best thing that's going to get you one step closer to your goal. You can create your identity, whatever it is that you want to be. Ask yourself, what do I got to do that's going to put me in the next best position to succeed? Because anytime you hear a question, you look for the answers. It's impossible. If I say, Anna Gill, what, what's that first book that you wrote on the, on, the, on the desk right there? You, me, and everybody hearing this right now are thinking about that. So ask yourself the right questions, mm-hmm. decide, and then make, make action. Wow. Powerful. Everyone see how he was like, he was ready to answer that question. Like that was the question that he's like born to answer. As soon as I answer, asked it, bam, you jumped on. Um, Zach, you said something. I don't know where I first learned this man, but it has changed my life. I think it was with someone who was coaching me at one point and was, it's not about the answers. It's about, it's about, it's about the questions. Ask the right questions. I, this is what I coach my team with now. When I talk to my team, my own, you know, I, they're having a challenge and I'll say, well, what's the challenge you're having? Well, our sales are down. Okay. Well, why we keep breaking down and we eventually get to, you know, oh, well, we have less leads than we need. Well, how many leads do we need? Oh, we need 50 leads. Well, how are you going to get 50 leads? And all of a sudden we started on this, like, well, holy crap, the world's coming to an end. We can't solve a problem. We got down to a solution created by the same person who brought a problem to me. Right. And now we have an exact solution step-by-step. I've done this with every team down to like the design, like I'll have design uh, team. They'll be like, we're completely confused on how to design this. And I'm like, Oh, that's interesting. Well, and we just break it down and eventually they have their own solution. I cannot, echo that part of the advice that you just said enough. I love it. And you just drew attention to it for me again, to even amplify it further in my life. It's about the questions we ask. Zach, it has been an honor. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I'm not done. I I feel like, I feel, I feel incomplete. I'm going to be honest with you. Like, I feel like there's just so much more we could talk about and so much more I want to learn from you. I don't think three is the only lessons, number of lessons you got from prison that have impacted you as an entrepreneur. And I hope to dive deeper into it. And I hope to do that soon when you and I meet I definitely will be there for your podcast and then maybe we can hang out for a while more and tell more of your story. But thanks so much for being here, man. I I completely almost forgot. I know right now you mentioned underdog empowerment. People want to, people want more of you. Where can they go right now to get more of you? Dude, that's the spot, man. Dude, I'm super grateful and appreciative for you having me on here. Finally got to jam, dude. I've been looking forward to this moment. Uh, If anybody wants to get in contact with me, it's underdogempowerment.com. All my socials, all that stuff are on there. The podcast, hope to see you over there. Uh, Onik, dude, thank you so much for having me. I can't wait to come out there at Learn and uh, get down with you on an in-person interview on Underdog Empowerment. It's going to be a blast, man. Oh, it's going to be a blast, absolutely. And we'll bring you, Fighting Entrepreneurs, a part two with him as well. Underdogempowerment.com. If for some reason you're confused, we'll put the links and everything up at onikpodcast.com. Head on over. It's been amazing, Zach. Thanks so much. And what a better ending for an episode like this. This is more fitting when I say, when life pushes you, stand straight, smile, and push it the heck back. That is exactly what this man did. And I love the fact that I could say that with him here right now because he's a living embodiment of it. Go to learn.com, L-U-R-N.com. Go to onicpodcast.com. Binge, listen, and tell the world about our podcast and also about underdog empowerment. Come on, fighting entrepreneurs. Go out there, fight for your dreams. Until next time, this is Onyx signing off. Thanks for listening to The Fighting Entrepreneur with your host, Onyx Singal.